Welcome to the Sportlink podcast. I'm Mark Armstrong and today we've got a very special treat as myself and the Sportlink panel of John Fenson and Neil Featherby are joined by former European Indoor 1500 metre champion Matt Yates. Matt was one of the UK's top middle distance runners in the 90s as he competed at three world championships and an Olympic Games as well as picking up a Commonwealth Games bronze medal. Upon his retirement, Matt took a long break from the sport before entering into the coaching world in 2015, which has seen him establish himself as one of the most respected coaches in the country. We're going to be talking to Matt about his journey to the top, both as an athlete and a coach, as well as gaining insight into the mind of one of the UK's foremost coaches. So, chaps, how have we all been? Are we OK? Uh, all, all safe and well, I hope? Yep. Another week yeah. done. Another week done. Another week to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, all yeah, all, uh, yeah, all good. I can't believe... I, yeah, what day is it? I have no idea. Is it Monday? Sunday. And how many... Yeah, and how many... How long has this lockdown been? I just don't know. No. I'm just totally lost all... If you followed Fred. your training programme to the plan, you'd know what bloody day it was. It is Monday. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you <laughs> yourself up there, aren't you? So, Matt, oh, it, it must be really different at the moment to what, what, how life normally is as a coach for yourself. How, how have you sort of responded to, to the demands of it? Um, it's been challenging, you know, because like, I'm not dealing with just... Well, I am dealing with, like, you know, people that run for fitness, but also dealing with the elite side. And, you know... It's mentally really stressful, and people don't realise that. You know, on top of, you know, I'm furloughed at the moment from work, and uh, you know, and I'm very heavily involved with horse racing and stuff, so that's off. So we're worried about the future there. So you've got all the stress about work, you've got family stress, um, the, all the stresses everyone else is going through, but then you add the athletics on top, and you're dealing with the guys there, and also their careers. So you're almost like a, a boss of their careers, a CEO maybe the chairman the board making decisions for them and uh you can't make decisions when you don't know what's happening no. and it, and leading up to like the olympics was called off i had a pretty good idea that was going to get off i had the inside on that before it happened so i told the lads it's not happening um but the europeans wasn't called off till last week i don't think and the guys thought that there was an opportunity to run the olympic uh, to run the europeans and that's creating stress because you've got to mess around with your training schedules, how do you do stuff? You can't get in a gym. Most of them can't get on a track. I mean, most of the elite athletes in this country are actually um, it's quite funny because they're being chased off tracks by, you know, maintenance people. <laughs> and obviously they're not being caught. <laughs> you know, you can imagine some greenkeeper or, or, or groundsman chasing, you know, Reese Prescott across the ground. <laughs> you the first 100, have you? Even on a bike, you can't catch him. Um, so, yeah, it's been very trying, to be honest. And uh, it's, you know, I, I do find it stressful. I think most coaches find it stressful. But I think, like anything, is that you have to be very positive in these times. And I, I, things will change massively. Of course, they will. We're starting to discuss changes and accelerated change across the world in all kinds of areas. And, you know, you've got to adapt and evolve. And if you don't, you will die. Simple as that. So how have you taken the approach with your athletes? Have you sort of detrained them a bit at the moment, sort of taken, them, t- taken the, the workload down a little bit at the moment? Or how have you approached it? Um, the last two weeks, it's really what I've had to do is uh, we kind of got into this phase where it's like, you know, at the end of the track season and before you go into cross country and you go and have that two weeks, like Neil will probably go off to Ibiza or something like that, two weeks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you stopped going to Mykonos now, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I wish. <laughs> he, he, normally, he normally wears a hat when he's down there. Yeah, so and sunglasses. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, the end of the season finishes, they have, like, a couple of weeks off, um, which I've changed my coaching view to, because I think they should train every day, do 20 minutes running, because when you come back, you spend two months trying to get back. Um, and then you go into training for the outdoors, uh, for the for the cross-country stuff and, and, the, and the phase one, phase two conditioning, and which takes probably five months to do. So we've kind of brought them back into the earlier, like, the first part of phase one training, but what we've done is, as a group, is we've turned around and, and we've empowered them to do, to set their own schedules. So what we're doing is we're turning around and saying, right, there's two sessions a week for you here. In the two sessions, there's three choices. 
choose one of those choices in the in in both of the, the sessions in a seven day program we want you to create your program which will include running bike walking and rest you make up your own decisions what you want to do on the seven days but you've got two sessions that you choose to do send us the schedules we'll have a discussion about it we won't change it unless they're doing something like 40 mile runs or something which Bevers probably would have done. <laughs> um, um, and then they're sending it. So we're getting this communication going and we're empowering them to learn more about the scheduling and how, how do they train and why do they train. I mean, also including that's SC work in their strength and conditioning, of which their coach is sending them videos of what to do. So, you know, chairs, dining room tables and chairs have been turned into gyms and uh you know, so that's been quite productive. But it's like life during wartime, really. You know, what do you do? So it's, it's a struggle, like, you know. And, but, then, and, you know, we're trying to educate and we're trying to create communication. One of the big things about Mark is that, you know, mental health. You know, everyone's struggling. I don't care who they are. struggling in this environment. And, um, you know, I think it's a very important thing that we, we, we address mental health as part of their training schedules. So we're trying to encourage and empower them and get them into conversation, talk about them talk about where they're going, give them hope. You know, this is, you know, now our guys probably know we <laughs> might do some diamond leagues, but very unlikely. And we've got to progress from there. So the first thing will be the Met League cross country for most of them, five miles yeah. over over the cross country in October, maybe. And and do you have to sort of, when you have these discussions, do you sort of tailor uh, it to sort of the athlete's experience and that's all that and their personality? Can, yeah. can, do you have to sort of keep an eye on, on some athletes more than others, perhaps, that I keep on top of them? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, Jamie Webb is very different to Dan Rowden and or or Van Etzen, a German athlete, or to uh, or Sean Malloy. They're all very different personalities, different motivations. Also, skill sets are different as well. Some are good at s &C, some like a long run, some like a tempo, and some might want to do four by 100. But obviously you don't let them because you're going to kick up the arse. But um, <laughs> it's they're all different personalities. They're all motivated in very different ways. And you have to understand them as a coach. But what we're trying to do at the moment is engage them to discuss about their training more so, not one to really discuss it outside of this situation probably. And then we try and grow them as athletes. And, uh, you know, we've got to be very positive in these times because it's unknown, isn't it? Mm, mm. And how how do you look after your athletes sort of mentally? I, I, I know I've read interviews where you've sort of said before that you're quite happy to sort of defer to something to someone else if they've got an area of expertise, like yeah. nutrition, for, for yeah. example. But does, does that apply to mental health as well? Yeah, I mean, mental health. I mean, we've got sports psychologists and um, we don't have main, mainstream psychologists working with us. But, we, you know, any area, UKA do support us in that, you know, the funded athletes are – they do have some, you know, psychological help if they want it. The biggest thing with psychological help is most people don't think they need it. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone needs it in some capacity. It's something I address. You know, I had psychological issues when I was, you know, I suffered from depression and anxiety. I think depression and anxiety probably took me 16, 17 years to actually realise. Mm -hmm. And I had to go for a course of counselling and all the rest of it. And I'm a better person for it now because I can actually regress to see why things needed to change and what was the stimulus or, or or the pattern of why did that happen. I understand that. So with the athletes, I kind of see that point, but it has to come from them. And I, I can only suggest mm. it to them. Um, yeah, I mean, some of them would hugely benefit from it. But then as a coach, I think you're a psychologist as well. Mm. I mean, Neil will probably talk to you more about it from the boxing side. But I think we have to be very careful how we speak to athletes in training sessions. Or even how we communicate on a WhatsApp group, we have to talk positively and in the right way, manner. You have to think twice about you send a message, mm. um, you know, because it doesn't come back; it's there forever. And you have to be very positive about it. It's something I learned from Bruce Longden, funny enough, positivity of, of training sessions. Because once you've done them, they don't come back; they're in the bank. Something has to pop, come out of it, you know. So the athlete psychologically has to come from them, basically. You can suggest to them, but unless they really want to engage on that level, they're not going to. I mean, I certainly would never engage on anything psychological when I was an athlete. Not a chance, because I thought it was probably a joke. 
Yeah, I mean, did you sort of see that, you know, the old school was sort of a sign of weakness if you had to call out for help? Um, Do you mean, or...? I think, John, when you when you say help, I mean, really, is it necessarily help, or is it making you... <clears throat> well, it's more just... It, people, you know? And yeah. So I think it's a combination of the two things. But I think it's like an armoury, really. You know, if you can hmm. like, be really good under fire and really calculate how you do something you're probably going to survive and win, you know? And I think the psychology of it always obviously comes from experience, but um, it has to come from you if you want it. You know? Absolutely. I yeah. think it's a big part now. I think it's something that yeah. we can actually grow within and, and improve yeah. athletes' performance with it. Also, I hope, you know, with the current situation that everyone's going through is that everybody's questioning their mental health. And actually, mm. it's a good thing to start discussing it. You know, I've... I've had a long sort of history of mental health <laughs> issues myself. And actually, you know, I know the importance of talking about, it, and I still sometimes struggle because it's so easy to get stuck yeah. in your head about it. And I'm sure that's the same for athletes, you know, that mm. they sort of have got to stay on target and, um, and put themselves under unnecessary pressure. Yeah, you can see pressure in athletes. I mean, I, I play on pressure, you know, I know how to play the game. Mm. Uh, again, it's learned from being around people like Neil with boxing and stuff like that. And Neil gets it, like, on certain things. But, you know, if I'm in a warm-up area, I know what I'm doing. You know, I've been around professional football, so I see how players change in a tunnel, you know, and and they suddenly fall apart. And uh, it's the same in athletics as well. Maybe I was guilty of falling apart sometimes as well, you know, because I didn't quite get it. So is that is that also um, understanding uh, resilience effectively? It's, be, yeah. it's becoming more resilient to these... Um, Negative thought patterns or, or or more resilient to the, the big occasions? Yeah, I mean, I certainly I didn't have a problem with big occasions when I was young, but I think as I experienced them more, I probably become a bit more of an issue because of pressure and then understanding pressure. And how do you, as a coach, for example, build pressure in the right way that it's a very positive experience to get the most from something? Now, everyone's different, right? So I'll give you an example. How I would talk to Elliot Giles, who, you know, won the European medal, um, would be very different how I'd speak to Dan Rowden. Mm. You know, how would I, in the warm-up area, I'd talk to Dan very differently than I would to Elliot, you know, or as I would to Jamie, for example. They're all very different animals, and, mm. and their stimulus and motivation are all different because all their backgrounds are different as well. Mm. And you have to understand that as a coach. How do I get that little bit extra from the right wordage to get them really up to this? You know, mm. often you don't need to get them up because they're already up for it. And you just have to say a couple of things, they get on with it. But sometimes you do, because sometimes you just don't want to go out. Where, 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 do you think, where, do you, where do you think the pressure comes from, though, Matt? Because it comes from so many different areas and it affects us in so many different ways with yourself when you were talking about you feel that you were guilty of it during your own career. I mean, I remember you, and it was like yesterday when you were competing and, and all sorts of things, and you were always... A really nice guy. You always had lots to say. Um, you always came across as very, very confident. But looking beyond that, you know, it's like anything else, isn't it? Looking beyond that, you sometimes think, I wonder. Mm. Um, but in terms of yourself as an athlete and going to the major games, let's call it, I don't think you fell apart at all at the end of it. But if you feel that you um, underperformed in any way due to nerves or fear where did that fear come from where did the fear of failure come from yourself I mean, or outside of outside of other areas yeah i mean firstly right now when you get into the elite athletics world mm. you know it's not level the playing field mm. right you know that right so you know that you will go up on the 1500 against 12 runners right and you're pretty aware of the field's cheating mm. and you won't beat them Mm. And I knew that, right? and I think that affected me mentally as well. I mentioned it recently in, that, in an interview, which was sent you, you know. And that's, you know, basically I'm implying that. And I knew what was going on. And, like, how do you go into war, right, knowing you're going to lose? Do you know what I mean? Mm. How, how do you do that? And I knew what was going on. I knew who was beating me, and I knew what was going on. I knew exactly when it all started, right? And that affected me, because what's the point beating it? Do you know and that, 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 that's a really good, good point and, and a good question and everything. But then the, then the other thing, Neil, is the press get on top of you. So that's another pressure, right? Yeah, pressure. The press, the, the, press, the press start telling you, and I understand the press inside out. There. I get it, right? You know, I understand they've got jobs to do and all the rest of it. But I also understand the press put 
a lot of pressure on athletes, mm. you know, or sports people. I mean, Raheem Sterling's just recently talking about a deal, and then I was he's deciding to Puma. And then I'm reading some of the comments from people on it. It's like, yeah, it's just, just, you just don't get it. Do you know what I mean? You, you just don't understand well, it. People better. don't understand it. That's the whole point. People don't understand it. Yeah, and I mean, and you get pressure. Just go around and try and explain yourself either. That's the, that's the other thing. And let's be fair now, with social media and mm. Twitter and... It's worse. Trust, yeah, yeah. it's a nightmare. You know, that, that's the whole thing. You know, so you have got yeah. a problem. But on the other hand, you, it's about, do you just blank it out? I mean, let's go back to the 1980 Olympics with Ku. You know, he was the favourite for the 1500, Uber, uh, sorry, for the 800. Uh, no, Ku was the favourite for the... It was favourite for the 800. Ku was the favourite for the 800. Uber was unbeaten going into the 1500 for God knows how long. I think Steve Scott had been the previous person. I beat him several mm -hmm. years before. Um, and obviously Uvet won that 800. Now, I can still remember that race like yesterday. In fact, I still watch it quite regularly. But you need to watch it again, Neil, and I'll tell you why, right? Mm. Watch it again after what I tell you. Yeah. Watch the East Germans block Coke. Yeah, yeah, they did. Well, you they don't did. think that wasn't prearranged as well, it was. right? It was. Because they never wanted Coke to win that race, the East Germans. And then one of the East Germans, I think, finishes third. Did they? I, I think. Don't think he, don't think he did because you're over at so you, When you watch the race, well, you can watch it again. The 800 meters there wasn't co bottling it because he didn't. Mm. You know, if some of his race performance is slightly wrong and his position is slightly out, but he it's was tough, the only way he could win that race was by front running mm. with what happened in that race. And people don't talk about that because they don't know about it, right? He wins the 1500, so he reverses it. But I mean, as sports psychology goes, I mean, I mean, there are sometimes you've got to look a bit deeper, Neil. Like, that, yeah. like but again, you know, everyone should go out and watch that race again because Seth didn't bowl it. You know, he, he just was up against it. And like I say, if he had a front runner, he probably wins the race, you know. Yeah, but yeah, he, was, he was blocked at just three points all the time. Yeah. But I, that's where I was going with it. I mean, Uvet didn't take no rubbish on that day because I remember he was he was shoving the, the East Germans all over the place. But then going into the 1500, yeah. the, the crap that Ku had to take, I can remember the train and run he went on between the two. And you'll remember this, man. Yeah, where he going, yeah, yeah. The head was with Trail of Shame. He did a 10-mile night. Like said, the head, yeah, yeah. And they, they followed him all the way. Yet, the pressure going into that 1500, he had to win that 1500. If not, he was a deemed as a failure. So once again, that's where I'm going with the sports psychology and bottling right. out and not bottling out. I, I mean, I think, uh, personally, I still think Uvet could have won that and I still think Uvet should have took the silver, but I don't think he was asked, you know, but when he when they came out the home straight, I think he almost gave up anyway, just sat back anyway. And <clears throat> that was yeah. a, um, a um, Busser or, or Straub, the East German who got the silver, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 But once again, what I'm saying is in terms of sports psychology and blanking things out and standing on that start line when it should be all and end all, I think there's a certain type of person that... <sighs> I mean, you have to be able to eradicate every every little bit of negativity when you stand on that start line. Everything. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what happened there was this, right? He, he come through. I think the semi final when he ran off the track. Remember when Seb ran off the track was celebratory? Do you remember that? When, when, when was that? Seb comes off the track in the semi final in the fifteen hundred. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm jumping around like you know. Peter got hold of him after that race. Brilliant bit of psychology. So Peter is dad, he's coach there. He's got hold of him and he's like, "What are you doing?" What, what, what's all this about? You're a joke. You are going to get rinsed in the final. Mm. You don't do this. You don't do that. You should be embarrassed about what you've just done. Absolutely put him in his place, mate. Like Sir Alex Ferguson put you in your place, you know? And I think that really toned him into performing in that final. I, I mean... The Italian, weren't they? If you remember, there was an Italian in one of the one of the heats of the semi-finals that just tried to nudge him, didn't he? Tried to psych him out, kept looking at him down the home straight. And I got a feeling he did come second in the semi or the... No, I, I don't know, but it's worth watching. But his dad pulls him to the side and he absolutely bollocks him, right? And that puts him in tune for that final. Because there's still young people, you know. We are, we look at them like they're 30 years, but they're not. I think Seb might have been 22 or something like 23. They were, really young. they were young, yeah. So, yeah. No, well, 23, 24 in there. But the pressure's immense and people don't see that. Like, and I'll give you an impression, like, what is the Olympics like to go to, right? So the Olympics for pressure is like nothing else. I don't, I don't think footballers are experiencing the World Cup because they're locked in a little cocoon. But when you get to the Olympics, you, you get to the city where it is and all the, all the build-up to it is all, you pick up your cereal packet in January and it's got the Olympics on the back of it, you know what I mean? And you're going to that. The pressure's building. Plus, it's your dream to always go there. And, like, it's just phenomenal. And then you get in the city 
before you even got in the village, it's like, wow, this place has just stopped. The world is stopping to watch this one thing. Then you get in the village and it just accelerates and you're just totally in this cocoon of, of, of sport and it's very difficult. And the pressure starts building and it's a question of how do you deal with it? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, some people don't. I mean, my, I, yeah, I mean, it is really, without actually going through it, you don't really get it. Plus the press as well always build you up, you know, to knock you down. That's just what they do, you know, mm. and, and that's pressure as well. But today's pressure on young athletes is massive because they're legends in their own social media platform now. Some of the shit I see them doing is unbelievable. Man, do you, do you... I, I, I get social media and I understand the propaganda <coughs> around it. I understand it. And if you use it in the right way, you can get a lot from it. And I certainly do that, you know, and might be portrayed as something from it but i do get social media and i you know i do use it a lot because you can get some good messages from it and you can learn a lot from it and you can learn a lot about opposition in it as well um Matt, but, yeah, do, I mean, do pressure you, of psychology is huge do you think you suffered as, uh, as a result of coming after the the uh yeah. era so that the press yeah, yeah. were looking for the next big thing and, and obviously yeah. you're, you're right yeah. Out there. yeah i think 100 percent. and you've got to remember mark it's like i made that team when i was 20 like, you know what I mean? And the only person who'd done that before was probably Ove and Cram, probably, mm. right? Seb, Seb, I think, come into the Europeans. So I, I walked into that, and, I, you know, I, I've said this before, it's a bit like being hey, Prince Harry, do you know what I mean? You're never going to get the proper job, are you? <laughs> but you can have everything that comes with it, you know? <laughs> and for the first three years, I was getting a lot. You know, I was getting decent contracts with Nike and whoever, and I'd done really well from it. And, you know, but I also come from just outside of London on the edge of it in Essex and, and also had a very good lifestyle in London on the back of that money. So I was my own self to blame, you know? Mm. But you weren't, you know, given the sort of, uh, you didn't have the necessarily the maturity to handle it or the, no. the skills to give that, you know, is no. it, are, are athletes now better prepared? Is there better support for them to handle that sort of thing? Uh, not necessarily. I think they get less money than we got though. I don't think they get the same as what we got, you know? But, but then does that put them under pressure to become more of a presence on social media of yeah. you know so, so they have sponsorship elsewhere a lot of their sponsorships are based on the social media following mm. and plus what these people don't realize is <clears throat> i had to take it out one of the athletes when they started out with so your social media has got to change because it's been watched by brands mm. and you've got to behave in a certain way you've got to portray yourself in a certain way it's a lot of pressure Raheem Sterling, actually, I read, had taken down quite a lot of social media stuff off recently to represent himself. So they have the athletes have that as as a really big thing to them, and uh, sports brands are, or sponsors are looking for that social media presence to base upon what they're going to pay them. See, we never had that, you know. Mm. We, we, you know, anything we've done might, you know, not, and I am guilty of having a bit of with stuff. It's quite funny when I look back on it. But, you know, it's the pressure's not like now, I don't think. No. On, on, on sports people. I think now they're on, under immense pressure. They, camera phones are the worst thing. I mean, Neil, you never got away in New York with what you did, eh? <laughs> Were you? <laughs> I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> You were behind me all the way. Can, can we have a sanitised version of that? What happened? Come on. Or unsan- unsanitised. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, we can always edit it out, can't we? <laughs> what was it? it probably, probably one of the best nights of sport I've ever been to in my life. And, and going to the American's backyard and, and, and take the piss like that was... We weren't there to win. No, we no you couldn't win. You shouldn't have won. shouldn't have won. Yeah. You know, because the judges are against you and everything. I mean, Neil will tell you more about it. I mean, I was out there with Lennox Lewis's camp, but Neil was out there with Paul Ingle. What a night. I mean, I, I think I got in at 6 or 7 a.m. I can't remember. <laughs> with the Nation of Islam. Two days, two days later. Two days later. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? I, can't, I think it might have been a question of getting out for days, as it happens. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't competing then. I, I'd retired by then. I, had I, Neil? <laughs> well, <you still> <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I do remember it very, very well because Madison is also the home of boxing, as far as I'm concerned. Is that in your call? They're better too. So. What drove you, Matt, in your in your athletic career? What What was your well, motivation? Job? Yeah. Originally, it was to break two minutes for eight hundred because that's what my dad had run. 
No, that, really. that was the first thing, yeah. Then uh, being told I couldn't do something, I wasn't good enough, has always been a motivation through my life, um, which is, you know, I'll give you a classic example, right? So uh, it's a really good story. Um, at school, uh, my English teacher, um, I can't remember his name now, he basically told me I'd amount to nothing. And, I, you know, the old, when we were at school, it was like you were going to be a shelf stacker. Do you know what I mean? That, uh, 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 that was the put down to you. And when you filled in the old uh, the career sheet with the buttons and all that, the, the tick boxes, everyone in my class always got the same job. It's like a Mickey Flanagan joke, you know? <laughs> everyone was, everyone was going to be a van driver or something like that. <laughs> so he basically he turned around and said, I'd be nothing. So I always stuck in my head. I mean, I'm 51, I'm still talking about it. Right? Yeah. So it must have got me. So I'm like, fuck you. Do you know what I mean? I'm mm. not having this. And... At the age of, I made a book, I made a nice few quid, like, you Neil, know, when I was running the Grand Prix in t- at 20 and 21, like, finishing in the top threes and stuff like that, winning the road races. I mean, one weekend I made 70 grand, like, on one weekend's running, you know? Wow. Like, so I went and brought, you know, like, like a typical div that I was. Got out and brought this BMW, yeah. which is the only one in the country. And then the school that I was at had only asked me to go up there the, the following week as from when I got the motor and I've gone up there and parked it outside his classroom. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and then I spoke to him and I'm concerned have you got one of those yet? No, I didn't think so on your salary. You know, I mean, a stupid <laughs> thing to do and absolutely rubbish. You know what I mean? But it can tell you that, you know, I don't agree with my behaviour there, but it can tell you what motivations can drive you through the dark winter nights mm, when yeah. people say things to you. And that was a largely a lot, a lot of my motivation come from that. You know, people saying that you're not capable of it, you're rubbish at it and stuff like that. And that was when, when you look out the door and you go, oh, I don't fancy it tonight, it's snowing. And you go, no, I'm going to do it. I'm out there, I'm going to do it. Right? And you go and do it. And they were the things, they were the voices in your head that made you do it, you know. Um, that was my motivation, certainly. I mean, I've certainly spoke to, I mean, like Jamie Webb, before he won the silver medal at the Europeans last year, like the team talk, we always have team talks. I mean, something that Neil and I have experienced in football and things. Coaches generally don't do team talks, but we do. So we don't. We park everything up. We don't discuss anything until we get ninety minutes into the stadium. Then we discuss what's going to happen. So we know the weather conditions. We know the track shapes and all stuff like that. So with Jamie, it was like quite an emotional team talk where he went in, and um, I was like, Jamie, you know, people have written you off. There's people in this stadium today said you weren't good enough to be in certain places and they're standing over there and you know this is a great opportunity for you today you know this is i believe that you're going to do it i believe that you're going to win it and i told him three or four months before that he was going to win the european indoors i, I totally believe that because i've seen some of his work then we sat down there with his dad there and when we were chatting about it and it was it was you know typical team talk and he's like right, now the job starts the warm-up's going to be this it's going to be 11 minutes of jogging blah, blah, blah. everything's worked out call-ups there, you're going in last, this is the game we're going to play. And you could just see him listening, going, it, it, you know, I'm trying to find the triggers that motivate him, you know, and I think I probably found him, he finished second, and he walked off, he goes, oh, I know, done well and everything, I've gone, not really, Jay, because you should have won the race. Hmm. You know, you should have had gold, you shouldn't be talking to me about silver, and I totally believe you should have been the European champion. But from where you were to where you are now, it's a massive change. It's huge and it's brilliant. But we've got to progress from there. He ran 144 and a half, I think, months later. Number one in the UK. I think he broke his PB by a second and a half. I'm not sure. But it's finding people's motivation. And mine was certainly what people said I couldn't do. It was often the challenge of what I wanted to do. And mm. I don't know about you guys. I mean, you're all going to have different motivations. Every single one of you will have them. Mm. You know, it's a question of, as a coach, you find the trigger points. Sometimes the trigger points can go over the top. You end up having a fight with someone. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about. It. Can I ask one thing, Matt? I know, I know, Matt's got a script, and we're probably not going to go through all the script now. But what are your thoughts to the future going forward in terms of how things are evolving with product? And we can talk about the shoes, the carbon shoes, but not just that. I mean, obviously product, because it's not going to go away. I actually think everything will change. I think there'll be something else that'll come along and it will be allegedly better than carbon shoes, et cetera, et cetera. But just everything in terms of how 
the sport has evolved, especially over the last few years in terms of, let's be fair, the Africans are virtually dominating all the distance events. Anything from the 800 metres through to the marathon. Um, is that put, I mean, if you look back to the 60s, 70s and even 80s, we were much stronger in depth, certainly up to the marathon in the marathon distance. Look at the rankings, you know, going right back through uh, the eighties, it's better. We've got some really fast guys at the sharp end, but the depth. You know, when I was when I was around, and as I keep going back to, I was average, but I could still get paid to race anywhere in the world almost. You know, I could get a trip anywhere. You know, suddenly, next thing you know, you suddenly got all these Africans coming in, and the the race promoters and directors saying, "Why do we need to pay you to come over here when we can get Africans over here for nothing? Because they're just going to come and win all the money anyway." So, how do, how do you see the sport evolving going forward? There's a, there's a lot of problems in the sport, like you know. Agents are a massive problem in the sport. Yeah. You know, they're causing so many problems, especially with the African dominance, which, you know, we've been going on about for ages that, you know, it's untoward and it's not good. Um, and, you know, we just, things change. And I get that. But the African thing is, that's destroyed the sport, mate. I get the results through weekly, yeah. So we have a special email that goes around and it lists the results and what's what's the news items in Global Athletics. <laughs> And the results for the road come out. You know, I mean, everyone is Eastern Europe, Eastern, Eastern Africans, um, you know, coming up with these performances. And you're thinking, well, I don't even know these people. Are. And then we get 70 positive blood tests as well. And it's a problem. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that side of it, I mean, I think will change. I think it will change when more people will come in. But as to. Um, the situation of, you know, where is the sport going? I mean, mate, you know my opinions about the shoe, but we're not going to change it. It's rules now. Yeah. And let's face it, behind you is a lot of money. Now, the shoes on the shelf are a lot of money. We keep it the same. Is the industry going to keep on earning? Are we making the sport sexy? Now, I don't agree with what's going on at all. Because an athlete that runs 28-20 and a pair of 4%, are they the same as an athlete that ran 28-20 10 years ago? No, they're not the same athlete. Chris Thompson says it quite bluntly, I think, in some of his comments. Um, but we've got to part that. Um, we've got to move on. We can't compare the past anymore, which is one of the beautiful things about our sport. We could compare Neil and Featherby running against someone five or 10 years before or 20 years before. We, could, we can't do that now. It's gone. So we've lost that side of the sport. But technology, I mean, the real threats, mate, are the spikes. I mean, the shoes are just like, wow. I mean, you see the spikes. And I've seen the prototypes. Mm -hmm. Just ridiculous. I mean, I've seen people run times in them shoes, and you're going, no way. No way. So there's, there's something in it, right? And they've been breaching the rules doing it, and it was crooked what was going on. And I was one of the first to voice, voice concerns about it uh, a year or so ago. and Nothing was done, but now they've they've done something about the rules. They're going to change again soon. The spike rules, I believe. So they're going to drop the certain. We almost said what then, but they're going to drop some of the stuff, which will make it better um, and improve. But yeah, I mean, technology is not a bad thing if it's done right, mate. You know, I mean, how much is that four four percent shoe worth to Nike? Mm. It's got to be towards a billion, isn't it? Easy. Once again, think about the thing we talk about the psychology. Think about the psychology behind it all again. You know, you stand on that start line and you're there to race, but you're the only one without them on. You know, you've got all the other you've got all the other guys who's or the, all the other guys standing there wearing them. So in that effect, you know, straight away, you've got to be pretty strong in the mind to think, I'm not at a disadvantage here. I should beat this guy, should be there or thereabouts. And especially if it's a trial race. So, you know, and, and you know, your opponents have got those shoes on. And think of the guys who are so I spoke to a few guys who are sponsored by some of the other brands. And they're in, in such a predicament now, thinking, right, well, I'm sponsored. And as you said, you know, they get an X amount a year per year, which they need for them. But they may well fail in the trials or whatever else because they haven't got the same same shoe on or the shoe that obviously isn't going to give them the same advantage that the, the Nike shoes do. We know they're all bringing out the carbon shoes, You've got the hookers. Brooks um, on, I think, are bringing out something as well. So they'll all be bringing something else until obviously the next thing come along, whatever it is that's going to be better than carbon. But even going back to the Africans, I mean, as I said, you know, 
the Af- some of the Africans aren't, shall we say, the top Africans. So they, you know, they can't get in their own team. They can't get in the Ethiopian team or the Kenyan team. So they change nationality. They go and run for Denmark or, or Belgium. Or- yeah, we kind of sorted that out, though, with the allegiance claims. And that's kind of put a stop to that now. Yeah. So we've kind of got a hold on that now. So we don't see it as much. But it has an impact, you know. Mm. I'm just wondering on the, on the whole thing, you know, the, the impact of sport, how it has changed and it, is, it will, will change. But <clears throat> I don't know. I just, my, 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 my question was, is what were your thoughts going forward in terms of the fact, yes, the last couple of years have definitely see, become better, certainly in the last three or four years, certainly in the marathon-based um, event, which is obviously my, my background. Um, but the, there's no, you can't get away from the fact the rankings and, and, the, and the strength and depth is nothing like it were was back then i think there's a few issues around it mate like so and i think they're complaining you like because there's obviously that them and us no it's seen as young as young people getting battered by us because we're saying you don't do this this and this i'm not battering anyone yeah but they do they do say it neil i mean you've only got to look at i'm a runner and all that it's like all these young athletes oh you're having a go at us and that and you're like well i'm not having a go mate because i coach so i know i get it i understand it you know i do something about it but you know for example just to come away from the marathon rankings, the 800 meter rankings are the strongest they've ever, ever been last year. They've never been that good, right? Um, the 1500 as well. We had three in the world championship final, you know, in uh, Whiteman, Gawley and Kerr, right? So we'd never done that before because we normally only have one in the final, maybe two. I think first one, 83, we had two. So, Things are improving, but the marathon distances is, I think you can't escape in the marathon, mate. And, then, and, and one of the interesting things about that is that you, you've got the graph. If you don't do the graph for a marathon, That's you are exactly. not going to fall. You get found out. You get found out. Oh, probably found out. You're going to get found out between anything between 17 and 23 miles. You'll be found. They'll, that distance will kill you, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm a three hour marathon runner, so I know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know that's I sometimes wonder do the guys because they've got the same talent I mean Hawkins has shown I mean Hawkins absolutely yeah. you know um, you know uh, Griffiths as well we've, they've, we've got some immense talent out there but is it doing the right work no. and that's see I think in your era like there's that famous book in there Marathon Legends yeah. by Gabby Collison yeah, and and you read through that interview, pro she interviews all the top runners, and they've all got jobs, mm. right? They all work. Mm. Okay, mm. so there's this belief now that if you if, if you want to be a top athlete, you don't work. Well, all of them guys worked. Every Speddy and all of them, right? They all went for a drink after work <laughs> as well, but they trained hard. And I was talking to Brendan Foster about this, right? So I was like, Brendan, what was it like training with that group up in Gateshead? He said, like, man, if you didn't go out on a run. And you come back last, you got battered. Mm. They battered you in the changing room after that. He said, so we're very competitive. We're always pushing each other in that group. And I don't know if that necessarily happens now. I think there's too much science and shit yeah. that yeah. Like, clouds it all. And you don't do this and you don't do that. But we know you can't escape from hard work. You know, you've got to do it, man. And you're, you're probably going to break down doing it. And the fittest will survive. Um and I think that's one of the issues. I mean, some of the training, like, the guys do train hard, you know, that, without doubt they do. But I think the world's a different place to the hardships. You know, let's just put it into context, right? TV finished at 12 o'clock with the national anthem in our days, right? There was no through the night. The pub finished at 11 o'clock, okay? And then it was only a half day on the Sunday. So you can only do two hours in the pub. Life was very different. A very different place. You only had three channels on TV, for example. There was only like there was a few newspapers. Life was a different place. Nutrition was different. It was probably better then than it is now. Too much processed foods now. Yeah. Plus, life was less pressurized. Would you agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. It's a seven day week, pre- and it's very pressurized for people. Sundays was Sunday. Sunday was a long run. You'd go out and run 20, 20 plus miles, and you might see five cars on the road, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was it. Life was so different. Um, and I get, I do get all that as well. Um, but we have to we have to manage that with athletes and expectation and management and lifestyle management and all that. We have to do that as coaches. And, um, and I think, you know, 
the talent is there. But where I get, I kind of, at, I was out training with Scott Overall the other day. And Scott's a two nine marathon runner, yeah, great, great. I think. Yeah. So I was out with Scott. I see him on the hills nearby here, and um, I see him I, like having a social distance chat with him because hmm. you know you wouldn't get away with anything less around there because the neighbours will report you. But so I'm like. I'm chatting to Scott about it, and we were chatting about stuff, and he was talking about the shoes, for example. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Scott, you'd have ran like two seven high in them shoes, probably, and that changes everything. Mm-hmm. I said, but the real elastic terms is it's a two ten, isn't it? And now we've got athletes who are actually running some of these times, and they're like, well, I'm better than you. And you're not, you know what I mean? You're not. And uh, but the reality is, this was the only year. This is quite interesting. This was the only year where you could have got away with it at qualifying times. Yeah, the next yeah. year, they're changing. They're going to improve by two minutes, mate. And you're going to have to run two minutes faster in the springy shoes. Yeah. So technology is, uh, was good for a year because everyone's copied it. Everyone's moved it on. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I do think people, they do train. I, don't, I just think the pressures on these athletes are much greater and much different. Plus, they also go, oh, I've got to go and train in Flagstaff for 10, 10 years. You know? like, really? Do you? Mm. Do it here. Everyone else did do it here. Matt, do you think we can ever get people to, to buy into athletics as a sport in the way that people have bought into running as a sport? Because they've kind of been separated out now in the running in the main the mainstream, like your mass, your mass events. But athletics has sort of lost that trust a bit. As, <laughs> and, and how do you get that to be a proper mainstream sport again? Or do you think those days have gone? I think one of the big things, though, Mark, is that we've got athletics is becoming, because of so certain issues, a sport once every four years, yeah. so, i.e. the Olympics that everyone watches for two weeks, whereas we were nurtured on the sport being a big Friday night at the Crystal Palace, uh, superstars, personalities, blah, 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 um, and we brought into that. I think, I don't think we need to change anything about sport to make it big again. I just think we've got to make more personalities in it, and we've got to tell their stories better and have more head to head. I was brought up on Ovet and Co and you know in, in a time of real social unrest of you know football violence was extreme. I mean really bad. I mean the Hazel Stadium, I remember I was I was doing a race against Steve Ovet that night at the Barnet Cotswold Stadium. And I finished I finished second to him that night. I never beat him because he packed in. But you know I just like I remember that vividly and I think that changed a lot of people's opinion about football, but football got it back. Football is what it is today. It's huge. Um, athletics is going for a transition. I think the, the last two years has been much better. People are starting to believe in it more. Um, I certainly do think it's a great sport. I think, you know, on, on all levels, I think it's a fantastic sport for everyone to do. But Mark, well, one thing you must remember about our sport is that it's the first sport of humanity. It's the, it's the first sport in us as a species um, from Greek times onwards, right? It's, you know, that's why the Olympics are. Also, it's the first sport in that what we do at school. It's what, it's what we all do. So, um, you know, so it's very, very important that our sport is the foundation of all sport and we can't forget that. And as long as we sell that up and sell that out, I think we'll always be okay. But we don't need to rewrite the sport. We don't need, you know, 75-metre hurdle races in the Olympics. we just got to keep it what it is. We've got to get the classics going again. And I think we can bring people through the door. Um, you don't go to Zurich and you can't buy a ticket for the Zurich meeting. You can't get one for Brussels. You know, it's a big social occasion. Crystal Palace needs to be a big social occasion. That's gone, right? You know, you need to leave school at 3 o'clock and then you'd have your picnic in the car park bit like you do at horse racing and stuff and then you go and watch a three hours of great athletics you know under lights and I think we've got to bring all that back you know we've got to bring our club system back into supporting that that end and creating really great personalities I mean Dina Asher is probably one of the best out I mean she's genuinely one of the nicest people you'll ever meet highly educated and a great performer mm. um you know we've had Jess Ennis and oh, Greg Rutherford you know, people like this, and you know, we do add the talent there to make the sport great. It's just how do we present it, and how do we do it? And you know, and I think people have rested on their laurels and thought money just walks through the door. Well, it doesn't, because we're up against football, we're up against cricket, tennis, American sports now are getting bigger over here as they push the franchises. And we're, you know, but 
on the basis of all of those, mate, we are the foundation of all those sports in movement and everything. So most people that are involved in those would have done athletics at some point in their careers. And we've got to sell that out. What would your advice be, Matt, to a, a teenager sort of who's got a bit of an aptitude for for running? What what would what would your advice be to them to, first and foremost? It depends what age they are. Like if they're like under eighteen, it's, I have this big issue about these kids that train super hard. Like enjoy sport, you know, enjoy it, mm-hmm. enjoy the social aspects of your athletics club and, yeah. and the integration that goes on at those clubs. You know, it's still a big part of my... I still talk to my mates in my first athletic club, you know. It's still part of my life. Um, half a century on, you know. So that's a big part. Enjoy it, OK? When you do make the decision to have a go, commit to it. You know, make the commitment and, you know, do something with because it won't come back. Mm. You know, I can't suddenly go, oh, I'm going to go to next year's Olympics. It's not going to happen. You know, I'm, I'm past that by what for what twenty odd years now. That's not happening. So use the most of your time and commit to it and find out what you can do. Try and work with the right coach or the coach that you're with. See what you can do with that person. So enjoy it. It's the first biggest thing. Um, and get the right support group around you. And in time, you'll learn that support group as you start performing. Um, and that's really my uh, my advice to it. I mean, I, I only committed to it when I was probably 18 or something like that. And then it's just a whirlwind. You know, at 20, I was in the senior team, you know, um, running with great athletes. And I don't know what happened after that. I kind of can't, re- I can't remember some of the races, Mark. I, I genuinely can't. I mean, I, people said, I, I'll tell you what, <laughs> but, uh, so I look back on it. So I'm running the Dream Mile and I got sent this video of me running the Dream Mile. And I'm thinking, I'm sure I finished third in that race. I can't remember. I do remember the part running down the back straight and because it was a six-lane track and all that. I was slow. Then I spent the next day, two days, really pissed off because I realised Steve Graham had beaten me. And I forgot all about it, you know. <laughs> so, you know, like, I'm like, my advice to any young person is enjoy it to a certain point, then make the commitment, you know. You'll evolve with the right team around you and the right people. And the, and, and, and the biggest people around you are your parents and guardians, without any doubt. Parents and guardians make an athlete more so than anything. And what you can do they get do some that? come through. I don't what, what can they do, the parents and guardians? What, what's their responsibility to it, well, do you think? First thing is they're a bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the first thing that they are. I mean, Tony Mincello was talking about this the other day on, 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 on his podcast, on the coaching um, thing that they run. And... Uh, the bank of mum and dad is so important, it's, you know, because athletics isn't, I know it's cheap, but you've still got to get to places and, you know, and all the rest of it. Um, nutrition. They're going to govern the nutrition of that person. They're also going to back them when they go to higher education, you know, what university. Uh, and they're going to be very influential in some of those decisions. But most importantly, they're with them a lot of the time. So they, so you might only see them twice a week. But the parents will see them all the time. So they're very influential over lifestyle, guidance, support systems, more so than probably a coach. So it's very interesting. I mean, Steve Ovet discusses on YouTube, he does, there's the 1980s interviews. I don't know if you've seen them, Neil. They're really interesting, right? So I watched them the other day. So you can get a lot out of interviews. And Ovet's talking about his family and how how much impact they had on him as an athlete. Um, they really brought him level and, you know, he talks about them with his dad, with his uh, market store, his mum had a cafe and he'd be in there helping them. And they, they were a huge influence over helping him, right? Um, and it's a really insightful interview which he talks about in between the, the 800 and the 1500 in Moscow, they interview him on this bridge. And I think that goes for most people. I mean, parents are very influential over athletes. I mean, Mark, Mark, just to elaborate on that, okay, the Ingbritson family, okay, mm. um, would they be as good if their coach was someone who was external to their family? Think about that. Not, because not. I don't know if they would, because every element of their lives is controlled. Mm. You know, every part of their life is controlled by the older ones are a bit different now, but they kind of live in the same 
house, you know. I think one might have moved away, I'm not sure. But they're controlled. Like everything about them is controlled by the parent. And they do the performances that they do. So would they still be as good if they were external? But that shows you the power of parents and lifestyle control from a very early age. Mm. Um, and I don't know what kind of people that produces. I've no idea. But parents are very, very important to performance in athletics. They really are key. Well, parents and guardians, let's say, because... Like, my grandfather was very influential in my career. He used to take me races and stuff like that. So, you know, his parents and guardians are a really big part of it. And if you want to succeed, enjoy it up to about the age of eight. No one remembers a good junior, mate. No one, no one cares about it, right? But what they remember is someone that's a senior athlete on TV. The public have no idea about a good junior, and they don't care either. They want to watch someone on TV. And that's where these athletes should be guiding and going themselves, you know, towards. And that's the big thing there. So, but, you know, you can walk into Sportslink, for example, and get some great advice over buying a pair of spikes. Do you know what I mean? And <clears throat> advice, which is fantastic, and, 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 and direction, which is fantastic from experienced people. And you could each just walk in there and get that advice, as you can for a number of other places as well. Um, whether you're you know, that that junior athlete or you're a senior athlete, just come back in at the age of 40 to do park runs and improve yourself into master sport. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you do need lifestyle and that's one of the commitments you've got to make. But for a junior, I'd always say just enjoy it. You know, I've done all sports. I've played cricket and everything. When I packed in, I couldn't wait to get back and playing cricket and football in veterans football. Just couldn't wait to do it. So I really missed it. I loved doing it. But I gave athletics what I had, and, and that's probably why I was good at it. And what's your relationship with your running now? What do you mean, personally? With your, your own personal practice of running, do you still run? Do you go out? Do you still enjoy it? I, like, I kind of like stopped running when people in the park started passing me. You know what I mean? And I, I still I, I do run occasionally, but I do a lot of walking now. I enjoy it for mm. me because. I can get out and walk for like 90 minutes around the country where I live and it helps me a lot. Mm. I've got some brilliant things. It's like sitting in a bath, you know, I've got some great ideas and, and you, you clean your mind and you can get that from running as well. But I kind of like do a lot of walking. My ambitions in running are kind of over mm. um, other than being fit. But I can't tell you this. So I had the virus for, I was really bad with it. I had to go to hospital and stuff. So the paramedics had come round here and they turned up pretty quick. They me away because I caught it at the Cheltenham Festival, right? I was working. I wasn't on social, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, and they come round and, and I was like really dreading it because I had to do the blood pressure and everything like that. And I was really, dub I was double dreading it. Like I was like, oh, here we go. This is not good, right? So they sat in, in, in the front room and they've gone, Right, do the blood pressure, and, and I'm going. I'm, I'm absolutely ruined here with this because I know I haven't been keeping fit, and I haven't been doing things right. And I do like a burger, right? <laughs> I, I, even the other day, I had to make McMuffins my way because McDonald's is closed, right? So, which are much better. And I'm not going back to McDonald's now. But anyway, so he done the blood pressure, and he goes to me. He got blood pressure of an 18 year old. I was like, almost fell over, you know. And that must come from my years of training and stuff. But it really did make me realise how important keeping fit and running mm. is in someone's life. And I'm really grateful for that because it wasn't in a good way. You know, I don't remember a week of it. I can't remember anything what happened. And, uh, you know, I think that past has really helped me quite a lot. But it's not going to make me start running this way, John. No. <laughs> but, no, but, the, but that's the thing motivation changes doesn't it throughout life and so you you're all motivated motivation ch progresses through life doesn't it and evolves i mean i do stand with amazement and i see the guys like around 22 seconds or 23 seconds for repetition 200s and i'm like wow that's rapid well, i could do that once and i'm like i never really appreciated what i could mm. do but i look at them and i go that's incredible i'm just amazed by what they do and it gives you a sense of the, the fitness levels and that you got to but one of my mental problems with running is that it used to be a job. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it turned into a bit of a job for me. So I, I, I looked elsewhere to do my fitness. But 
when I go out, and I, I do like, I, I take power walking, they'll take the piss out of me for that, yeah. But, um, so I'll go out and walk really strong and that, and um, enjoy it. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm walking around the forest and that on my own, and, uh, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm putting the world, and mentally, it just helps me so much. Mm. Will that turn into running again? I don't know. Um, I've got enough running shoes for it to turn into that. <laughs> My kit still fits me, but not the stuff that I used to race in, because that would be really... You Come know, up there and have a run with my dogs, mate. That'll get you back running. You can do what? a four-minute mile. Come up there and run with the dogs. What do you mean? How do you do a four-minute... What, on the back of a sled? No, on the back of the dogs. I'll harness you to the dogs, and you can run with the dogs. Oh, leave me out, mate. I will, I will be back in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. But no, I do. I, I, do I miss running? No, because it's hard. <laughs> and uh, he's hard. He, he's mm. really hard running. Yeah. And you know what? You can't escape on it, man, because you go out for a run, and I'm like, I used to do that 5K in like 14 odd minutes. Oh my God, that's saying like 50 minutes now. Do you know mm. what I mean? And I can't <laughs> deal with that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you've got that element. I mean, one of the biggest things, guys, is when you finish uh, elite sport, professional sport, is you think you can carry on eating the same. And I'm testing mm. that now that you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but no, it's no more running, mate. And uh, I, I probably might start. I might do the, the famous session of a minute on, a minute off for probably four reps. Does that, does that minute last a long while as well? <laughs> oh, mate, do you not know it? i done it in South Africa, right? So I was out there training with the team right out there. And, like, the lads have come down to watch me. They didn't tell me they were coming down to watch because obviously I give them grief when they're training. You know, I'm like right in their case, Ooh. picking them up off the floor. This is embarrassing. Come on. You've got the last rep. There's people watching and all the rest of it. They've only turned up to watch me running around the cricket field, doing a minute on, minute off. <laughs> the abuse I got for them. Like, <laughs> right? They're taking pictures of me and all that, which made it even worse, right? I've got into about two reps and they and they bowled up onto the, onto the cricket green over... Um, where we were training in in Stellenbosch, the shit they gave me was just like, and I thought to myself, I've had this coming for ages. I just want to find out who told them I was here. <laughs> you know, so, they wanted to know when the rep was going to start. <laughs> like, I'm like, at one point, it's really funny. So it's like one of the coaches was down there doing me timing for me because I didn't want to see the time. And I'm like shouting across, that minute must be up. He goes, oh, no, there's another 20 seconds to go. After the meeting, I've gone, after the session, I've gone, you were lying about the times, weren't you? He went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just wrapping up, we're going to do the uh, sort of a, a 10, 10 question rapid fire. Well, it's not rapid fire. You can be as quick or as long as you want, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, what would advice would you give your 20-year-old self? <laughs> I don't know, actually. Um, don't know. Well, it's such a hard it, question. It right? could be, it could be running related, or it could just be general life, or it could be financial <laughs> advice. Learn to make the McMuffins yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think stay away from the page three girls, wasn't it, Neil? <laughs> 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 no, it wasn't. Um, I think. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean. Problem is, when I was twenty, I had everything given to me. Like you know, I was, it was ridiculous what went on then. A superstar at the age of twenty, kind of thing, and, you know. And that was really tough to deal with. Um, I don't know. Uh, such a tough question. Um, in hindsight, get the right advisors and very strong people around you. I mean, my dad was very strong. Um, but it's your dad at the end of the day. They're always going to give you a bit of leniency. Um, probably have the right advisor for myself. That my interests at heart um, would be the thing. Hmm. Uh, and lifestyle as well. But then our lifestyle, our culture was very different then to what it is now. Yeah. You know, it was a different world. But probably lifestyle, I reckon. Lifestyle. And um, what's your proudest running achievement? Running away from Neil Featherby in New York. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, we'll have to tell that story one day, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, Escape from New York. <laughs> yeah, the English version. Yeah, the English version. 
Uh, proudest running achievement. I like the Fifth Avenue. Winning the Fifth Avenue was a pretty big deal. The, the, the Fifth Avenue Road Mile was a pretty big deal for me. Um, I don't know. I don't think I had one, really, personally. Several um, you'd have had, mate. I don't know if they were achievements, Daniel, because I always thought I could do better. And, and I messed it up. But, yeah. Um, the older you look back on them and you'll think, well... Mm. You know, there's, there's so many people, including me, who look back on your career. Like I said, the worst thing that happened to you is you come off the back of Ku, Uvek, Cran, Peter Elliott. Mm -hmm. um, but also, mate, most people, most people couldn't even dream to think about some of the things that you achieved and without embarrassing you, mate, because I know you just struggle anyway. But awesome. I, I don't think too many people, even around today, know what your achievements were. I think maybe like, I made that World Championships in Tokyo, the World, the world Championships. You final, didn't you? Yeah, and I was only young as well. And that was a cheat because I was right up against it there. And I, I shouldn't have done the 1500. I should have, still should have done the eight. Um, and that was a pretty big deal against the people I was against. But no, I just don't know. I mean, I probably have to go with my achievements, probably like winning in, uh, winning um, Essex School 3K in Colchester, you know? Mm. So I realised I could be a runner then. Yeah, definitely. But, that was probably played a big part. And as I said in an interview recently, like, I didn't get picked for the for the English schools team and that, that affected me, you know? Mm. So yeah, probably I'd go back to those monumental, monumental moments of when I realized I could do something. And yeah. that was when I was young. So um, what was the lowest point in your running life? I think the realization, the truth about elite running, probably about 94, 95. And I realized what was going on and I had a big problem around it because I was getting battered by the press, for example, for not performing. And then, like, they must have known what was going on. And, and I wasn't, you know, going to be involved in that. And found that difficult. Um, I mean, changing coaches was always a difficult moment, you know, because I left my dad and went to a training story that didn't work. And then I went to work with London. And then I went back to my dad, who brought me back on track, and he got me finished six in the Europeans off of hardly any work at all. Um, and then I packed in. Um, yeah, I think changing coach is always difficult, but you know that that. I mean, you do have low points where you run badly, and you're in you're in the warm down area, and you're just on your own, especially yeah. when you're overseas, you've got no one to talk to. And you think, what's the point? So you do have those moments of just coming out of them. Yeah. In particular, really. Um, what's your favourite distance? What to watch or do? To, to run. What was your favourite? Uh, 800, probably. What, and where was that? You've got you've got to be really on your toes in an 800, right? Because it can go off at any time, right? And if you're in the wrong position, you're down by a metre and a half. And you can't even be a foot. If you're out by a foot, you can lose a race, right? So if you watch 800 metre running, if you can't, I'm not giving you the inside to it totally, a lot of it's secret, right? And you give away a game. But there is some certain places, markers that you use to the point of a, of a second. And if you're in the wrong position and the cadence and the outputs of the athlete and so many factors come in, that if you get slightly wrong, you lose the race. So mm. as, a, as a spectacle, they're quite fun to be yeah. involved in and to learn a lot from. Um, so the 800 metres is great fun and, you know, anything can happen. Someone's going to fall. You've got all of those issues. But I also love a, a 1500 last lap burn up, which actually start about 600 to go. Uh, that's when the burn starts in international running. Um, but the 800s, I do enjoy watching them. Um, I love to see them, especially indoors, they're lively. Indoors is good fun to watch an 800 because someone's going to go down, isn't they? And you're going to have a crash or something <laughs> which makes it fun. Um, I think Ovet said, you know, middle distance running is quite, you know, tough and it's very physical. Mm. And it certainly is. Um, but the 800 metres is you make one mistake, you're out. Yeah. Come back to Neil Sebco in 1980 in that 800. It's a classic dart more of it. Mm. You don't have room for mistakes. You've got to be well on your game in the eight. Yeah. Yeah. The next one is what's your. Uh, favourite current running shoe but if you're not running what was your favourite running shoe? Oh we've got on this the other day on Facebook didn't we Neil? Yeah. Neil, Neil's was running all racer. 
<laughs> no, I wear my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> it's still got a pair, though. Yeah, he's got 10 pairs at the back in his size. He wears them all. Right. Yeah, yeah, wears them all <laughs> he, he does like runs in them, so no one sees him. I do um, run in them sometimes. I bet you do as well. I do. Yeah. yeah I do. Um, favourite running shoe? Um... I think you've got to go Pegasus, didn't you? One of the early ones. Oh, man, it was like a great show. I mean, like, Pegasus was like, you could wear it, and it just it was just a great... I mean, dare I say it, the one that they brought out about four or five years ago was really nice. I really like that one. Um, I was never an Asics person, even though they were my first sponsor. I always found the shoes a bit too, like, joggery. I, I like a, like a minimal shoe, which is really... It moves with the foot a lot. I like that. Yeah, yeah. No, that um, all of the 1990s training shoes were, I don't know, I don't think they'd ever really make anything like that again. The 80s shoes were great, and then the 1990s were just far too structured, weren't they? I, was, yeah. I remember all the Asian shoes, the old the old 2010s. and, and the, I never really got on with them, mate. You know, I just didn't. I, mean, I used to get on with because they were a bit narrower. Yeah, clumpy and hard as well. But Asics make great shoes now. But I was sponsored by Asics for a while as well. Hence the reason yeah. I've got so many of them. I didn't wear them all. I couldn't wear them all back yeah. then. Asics, I mean, especially if you've got the, the, the Japanese made racing shoes, are unbelievable. They're nice, right? But then the Nike Japanese racing shoes are really good. And the Adidas are still designed. The best racing shoes are by the Japanese designer, the Takanumi ones. Unbelievable shoes. Love them. Um, all our athletes get those shoes from Adidas, so that they're just there's two that they make, and everyone gets them. So they're really good. Um, I think modern day shoes. I mean, I, I get I get Adidas, so no, I work with Adidas. So um, modern day shoes, I really like. They just brought out this thing, the Ultra Boost Twenty, and I'm not so sure if it's a great running shoe, but it's just an incredible shoe. I really like it a lot, and they do one called the boost but what they've done is they've got a couple of shoes i really like but i'm not running in them mm. so i'm just talking about experiences going out for, and i look at them i like to if like say the sl 20s that have just come out i like to try them to know what they're like for the athlete mm. you know as, as much as I, yeah. just, I can kind of work out what they are but i think the big question is what's my favorite spike i think that's really the one and my favorite spike without any reasonable doubt when i was competing was the nike zoom one was it what was it with the zoom i remember yeah there was the, the blue one yeah yeah but i used to wear the sprint version yeah did you yeah yeah so i used to wear the sprint version for for racing in and i used to train in the others then i used to get them made mm. so all my spikes were made so what they were made with was they had a six millimeter eva through the middle yeah. full length so that that eva worked went all the way through Six plate on the front, zoom plate. Remember the blue plate, yeah. and then the zoom upper, which was narrowed down for my foot. The foot range, so yeah. So, yeah, and that's what they've done. And then, and then someone at the company for a laugh saw him sticking. But remember Martin Brewer? Do you remember him? I remember the name? Yeah, Martin was VP at Nike at the time. So he used to just be. He just, he's originally from Chelsea, mine, mm. and um, he's. I think you see him laying down in the in the lab, right? They made them up and all that. And then they send them to you from Oregon. Um, I, in fact, I know it was him because when I was with Adidas lately in my career, he'd done the same thing. Mm. So he put some uh, dodgy words on the back. You know, he used to put your name on the back. Remember mm. when, they, when they had made bespoke shoes, your name would go on the back of them. So they, they were yours. So if you look at any of the old shoes, even today, they still see the names of the athletes on the back of the shoe. Mm. Yeah. Well, he, he, he didn't put my name on the back. He put something else. <laughs> and I know he's probably behind it because when Adidas made my shoes in 97 they made a special shoe for me on similar design with one at the Adi Zero and they'd done the same thing and the same thing happened and he was at the company then so I know he's probably behind it mm. so mm. when it comes to spikes the Zoom, Zoom one just phenomenal I just everyone loved that shoe mm. um, today's spikes uh, I think I like the Adidas middle distance shoes with the ball. And yeah, there's an orange one they make now that's quite nice. But again, the spike designs all changed, so Nike have done some things. I mean, I, another thing is I used to wear steeplechase spikes, Neil. Did you? Yeah, because they were lighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were lighter, so I used to wear them. So if you watch, you see pictures of me racing in the late 90s, they're all steeplechase shoes hmm. because the uppers were mesh and that, so they were lighter. and 
And, and the other thing is I always insisted that shoes were white. I always had to have white spikes because the old school always had white spikes. So I had to have <laughs> white ones. So you do. <laughs> Um, in terms of service to surface to run on road, cross country or track, well, for competing, competing or for just enjoyment, you know, for training. Training would always be a forest, always be yeah. trails, always all day long, right? Uh, for a lot of reasons, but right? just like that enclosed avenue of speed mm. to go through. <coughs> uh, especially if you get a nice wood chip or something like that, they're just the best. And was know, that good as well for just l lower impact on your, yeah, your joints? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. So a lot. Of, I I try and run in the woods all the time. Mm. But when I was growing up, like we had these these parks and stuff, we used to run in, and they were really cool. Um, competition wise, obviously track. But I was mm. done. I was really successful on the roads. I think like I won all of the road miles around the world at one point. Yeah. Um, so I used to enjoy the roads. I don't know why. Mentally, that's because mentally the roads I probably found easier. And, the and what do you think that was? I think track's a pretty unforgiving place because you always mm. know where you are on the track. Yeah. If you're having a bad day, you're like, oh, I've got that much further to go, you know what yeah. I mean? Uh, whereas on the uh, on the road, you sometimes don't know quite. You can only gauge by the time. Mm. You know? And that, that can be an unforgiving place to track. Um, describe yourself as a runner in three words. Uh A runner in three words. Talented, mismanaged. Talented, mismanaged. That's three words, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> um, what if if you could race again, or you chose to run, yeah. what would be your first race on your bucket list? <clears throat> right now. Um, New York Marathon, I reckon. Uh, well, with that, I won be? the fifth, so you know, not I'm not that I'm going to win the New York Marathon, <laughs> <laughs> just to do it because I think it was the first, historically it's such an. I don't, did you run New York, Neil? Uh, nearly, I nearly went. I can't remember what year, but one year, I ne very nearly went, but I didn't. I tell you, I, I'd have loved to have done Boston. With, uh... See, I've been Boston. I was in Boston last year for Adidas Games, and it, I, I just loved the place. Just the most yeah. beautiful place, beautiful city. Fantastic mm. people, history was amazing, and I get that thing. But that Boston course is a bit hard, isn't it? Yeah, well, you got the Newton Hills in, but that's the classic race. It is what it is. You got the Newton Hills, I think, around about eighteen miles, but it's still just a classic race. And I think this is the first year that's never taken place since eighteen ninety-seven. I think. I think it's every single year, right, even through the war years. I'm pretty sure. So it's a shame it isn't taking place this year. But that's well, I think the... Boston's unforgiving, isn't it? Like I think there's a tourist type runner. So something you want to do to go through the five boroughs at New York is a pretty big thing. Mm. And well, I think the experience yeah. of how it changes is really strong as well. Everyone wants to do New York. Then it's one of the, the big city classic races like London, etc. <laughs> I don't mm. think London would get near New York, though, as an experience. No, no. Well, you know, some people say it will. I mean, I did London a couple of times, but you say it, it was good. First year was good anyway. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so New York for me, the marathon. Yeah. Uh, okay, two last questions. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to know the answer of both of these. Uh, you're five minutes away from finishing your race to get a new PB, but you're absolutely darn for a P. Do you quickly pull over and have one in the bushes, or do you just piss yourself and get your PB? Uh, <laughs> That's a long mile. If it was a mile race, <laughs> <laughs> not not these days. No, no. <laughs> did, you, did you hear my classic story about a mile, man? <laughs> Bevers, you'll love this, right? I was I was training in the gym, right on the on the old uh, treadmill, and I'm thinking I'm going all right here. This is pretty good, right? I never thought I'd be down on seven minute miling. I'm, I'm chipping. I'm I'm feeling good here. And the, uh, the younger ladies in the gym are quite admiring my graceful athletic ability at seven-minute miling until I realised it was kilometres. <laughs> 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 and that's true. That is really true. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I reckon in that situation, just piss yourself, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I think most people yeah. <laughs> would. I think courage that as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay it's the same question but instead of pee it's poo oh dear 
I had been in that situation on the training run. I decided that I'd have a M&S chocolate gatto about half hour before I went running. <laughs> oh, I didn't oh, oh, oh. through. <laughs> and I, and I, lived, I lived in Richmond at the time, in, in, in West London, which is ever so well to do, right? And I decided that I'd pull over and shit on the floor, which I don't think went down with the people who do it. I was two roads down from where I lived. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I can, I can even take you to the place where that happened. Uh, I could take you to where that happened. And, uh, yeah, yeah, not a good moment. <laughs> it, happens, it, happens. Yeah. it happens. Yeah, it's part, part of it. Well, it's only happened once. <laughs> Oh, certainly, yeah. Certainly. yeah so, if I never went back to M&S, I'd go Waitrose now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks ever so much for your time. Yeah, yeah. thanks very much, guys. Good fun. It's been a real pleasure, Matt. It really yeah. has. No, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's, it's yeah. nice to go over things. <clears throat> um, I think one thing is that everyone's passionate here about sport, and that's, you know, when that, when that comes across... You can only ignite that in other people, and I think that's a real key thing to driving our sport forward. Mm-hmm.